Welcome to TRS Clips, India's fastest learning portal. Make sure you subscribe, make sure you hit that bell icon. Let's start with the four wings that you named, you know, bureaucracy, education, politicians and the government in general. Yes. Uh, why don't you break all four down? If you can give an example, nothing like it, you sure. know. Uh, but in what way do they consult you? And uh, how do leaders their thing? Because I'm assuming that, see, if you are, say, the chief of military, you have to think of, okay, how do we protect India against China now? Yeah. Because that's the looming threat everyone sure. knows about. Sure. Um, I would also like to know what is the top layer of the bureaucracy thinking? What is the top layer of academia thinking? What is the top layer of the government in general thinking? What's happening there? Uh, I think that's a nice question. I like to break them into four parts, as you rightly pointed out. The first part is academia. Now, I'm not only talking about the university academia. So academia is actually the intellectual part of our community. Okay, they do the policy making, they do think tanks and being part of the Mumbai University, I've been very fortunate that, you know, I was instrumental in conducting the first International Yoga Day in US. Mm. So we had an international conference. So I have a perspective what happens today at the power level in the academia. So if you look at it today, we have a, a concept called a soft power. So hard power is where the military comes in, the strategy part of it comes in, but we are moving into soft power. Yoga, India's soft power, Bollywood being a soft power. And various other things. Cultural Ayur exports. Exactly. Even Ayurveda is a soft power. Mm. But we are moving from uh, soft power to what is called as the smart power. So in the academia, what generally happens is that we make policies, structure, schemes for the government. Let me give you a simple example. What, what does policy even mean? Like when you say, okay, you're making policies, what does it actually mean? Okay. So a policy from a corporate angle is about you know, how do you turn around your company probably in the pandemic era. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about public policy. So governments sit down and make plans which are important for the society. For example, we are in Mumbai. Okay, now what is the very important part of Mumbai right now? So the state government or the municipal corporation of Mumbai will sit down and say, okay, we need to have metros. And you can see all over the metros happening. Now that's a policy that has been set by the government after a lot of brainstorming. Now, how does a policy get formed? And I would suggest all of you to even think about doing a small course on public policy. It's very much available and, you know, a short course on internet. So many edutech companies are offering. Uh, so a public policy is a plan which is generally made by the top guys sitting over there, the bureaucrats. But they don't make it alone. They invite ideas from the public and you can participate in public policy. So on the academia side, you know, I've been involved in so many committees where we sit down and, you know, think about it. Like I'll give you a simple example. There was this particular idea that, you know, we should introduce leadership as a subject in our country. Mm. Uh, you rightly pointed out um, that, you know, uh, brain drain. What happened in the brain drain era is the best of the minds from India went abroad. And I would say, in a way, it was good in the long term, if you look at it, because uh, the guys who left India are still contributing to India. So if you look at the tweeters and the IBMs and the Microsoft and the Googles, all of them studied here. Mm. But there was this thought process that came in our university and saying that, you know, are we going to take it to the next level? What does our generation require? So it's okay, let us move from management to leadership, which is one step above. So we formulated the first ever institution in Mumbai University called the Chanakya International Institute of Leadership Studies. So we actually do a two years master's program on leadership. We mm. offer PhD in leadership. Mm. Now, how did this happen? So it was an idea, of course, with the vice chancellor and all the academia came together, brainstorm on it. There's a process to it. It is not an idea. Please understand, idea to a plan is business. Mm. Idea to a business plan is what we generally talk in the corporate world, in a startup world. But we are talking about a public policy where an idea has to go through a process where in the academia, we go through what is called as the board of studies, BOS. Typically, when you have to introduce a syllabus, you can't do it alone. Okay, so there is a group of five to seven people who come down, brainstorm what are the subjects to be taught. Then it has to be approved by a higher authority called as the academic council. Again, it has to be approved by something called as a management council. Then it's everybody approved by the uh, chancellor. So you have to look at the process. But after that hard work is done, then it becomes a part of the bigger game. Mm. So coming, I just give an example of how a public policy becomes a kind of a system in the academia, which I spoke about leadership. Now let me shift it to bureaucracy. In bureaucracy, the typical word means those people who run the government machinery. So the easiest word to associate with bureaucracy is a civil servants mm. or civil services. And there are many of them, you know, uh, highest is IFS, Indian Foreign Service, 
IPS, uh, Indian Police Service. We had Shivanandan sir on the podcast. Then we have IAS, Indian Administrative Service, Indian Forest Service. So there are many of them. Now, what generally happens is that um, the government is run through a machinery. Mm. Okay, So there are people who run the whole show. So if you look at today, we are sitting again in Mumbai, the municipal corporation. Now, there is some machinery which runs it. So let's say the commissioner of Mumbai Municipal Corporation. Now, he is a trained bureaucrat. He knows the whole systems, the process, he studied the rules. So in India, how do you become a bureaucrat? The first question. And the second is, what does a bureaucrat do? So uh, today, uh, there are open competitive exams. So if you want to become a collector or this general, you know, dreams people have in the tile two cities, uh, I would say even villages, you know, the biggest thing is to become a collector because that was a system started by the Britishers. So the government will select a few group of people through a competitive exam process. So there are so many exams that's happening, you crack them. And then you're trained in the government administrative system. So let's say you go through a two years of rigorous training and things like that. And after that, uh, you would be put into certain, uh, you know, states. For example, IAS officer or an IPS officer. So Indian Administrative Service or Indian Police Service. After the two years training program is over, they would generally choose which state they want to work in. So Shivanandan sir giving the example was actually from Tamil Nadu. Okay, born, brought up over there. But later on, uh, he cracked the exam and after his IPS uh, training, he was asked, you know, which state would you like to serve? So, of course, he chose Maharashtra. Mm. He comes to Maharashtra and then the whole 30 years that he worked in various postings in Maharashtra. Of course, from time to time, they go to deputations outside the state and maybe outside uh, the country also. Mm. So the bureaucracy generally functions to understand how the state is run. So if you look at civics and politics as a subject, they're the execution body. Mm. Okay. So, so today look at everything that's getting executed. There will be a bureaucrat both at the state and the central level. So that's the whole machinery that works. And believe me, uh, it's a system with a lot of power. Okay, so a collector sometimes also is also a district magistrate. He can take, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can take legal decisions. So that's a power that you get. Mm. Uh, coming back to what is the role of a bureaucrat? The role of a bureaucrat is to execute the kind of a decisions that are taken at the state level, which the politicians generally do, you know. So they will have an idea from mm. a bill, it becomes an act. Uh, I want to simplify it. Let's say, okay, again, uh, the government decides, like if we have to have, you know, national highways. So that's what Nitin Gadkari ji is currently doing as a head of all the highways at Noura. Now, who executes it? The politicians are representatives of people in democracy. So they get selected, they'll debate and discuss in the parliament. And afterwards, they say, okay, done. Mm. But karega kaun? Mm. So these bureaucrats come into it and they're very intellectual. They have budgets with them. They have the plans with them. They have a complete machinery with them. They have power with them. And believe me, if you have a good bureaucrat, he can turn around a whole city or a village for that particular matter. So coming back, I do work with the bureaucrats in giving some inputs. And I've been fortunate that many bureaucrats do call me and saying that oh, we have a small project. So rather, sir, can you handle it? So I'll give you one simple example. Uh, when the government decided that, you know, we need to take International Yoga Day really big. Okay, now that's a statement. Okay, but how do you do it? So I remember 2016. One of the ministers right over Delhi, Rajya Sabha minister, uh, he just called me up and said, you know, uh, we know you can do it because you're already part of academia. Mm. So, okay, can you handle this particular program? I said, okay. So what's the program? I have no idea. I don't worry, you'll get a call. So I got a call from an IAS officer. Okay, very sweet person and saying that, you know, rather sir, you know, we have this particular project by the government. We have the funds, we have the budgets, but we need to actually do uh, yoga in a very big way. So let's start with India and we'll take it global. I said, okay, so I don't understand it. But, look, but they said, you know, Radha, sir, we understand what you can deliver. I said, okay, let's have a meeting. So I flew to Chandigarh at that particular time. Uh, and with my uh, PhD guy, Dr. Shubhada Joshi, and so we went over there and said, listen, here is a project by the government of India that we need to make uh, International Yoga Day really big. Uh, thanks to our prime minister, you know, it was already uh, cleared at the international level where United Nations accepted uh, International Yoga Day as a formal day to be celebrated globally. But that's not enough. Mm. What do you do? So 2016, Chandigarh was the place from where we actually launched the International Yoga Day. So I had the power, a temporary power to actually hold the whole conference. So I took around 60 people 
from Mumbai University and of course Chandigarh. We hosted, we had three day major international conference where we had Baba Ramdev and all the yoga gurus coming over there. I was uh, instrumental in designing the program. When I say I, I mean with the whole team mm -hmm. of the government machinery. And it was amazing. And I can tell you a small uh, instant of uh, my first, uh, I would say, uh, rubbing with power. So since I was in charge, you know, I had two, three IAS officers over there. And I could see that one person was a vendor. He was actually misusing the public funds. Okay. So uh, simple, he was supposed to make some videos and things like that. Because we wanted to use it in a digital format and all. And I could sense that, you know, he's not delivering. He's trying to take money from the government. Okay. And now, remember, I'm a semi-bureaucrat. Mm. So I can't let my public funds go. And I remember I telling one of these IAS officers saying that, you know, I think this guy is something fishy. So now I'm on the side of the government. I'm not on a uh, public side. And you'd be surprised. Okay. Next day, he just came and told me and saying that he's been arrested. <laughs> I said, what? So you are in charge of the conference. <sighs> we just checked it and it was true. So he was misusing the power. And I said, oh my goodness. I said, wait. I just told that, you know, he's doing something fishy. Said, yeah, you have the power. Your word is last. I said, okay, thank you. <laughs> I just settled down. And I told my team also, you know, saying that, listen, this is temporary. So a statement in the government is not a statement. Your wish is my command. So think about which level uh, execution at the bureaucratic level can do. Of course, the good news is that, you know, don't worry about it. He came out of it and all those things, the money was recovered. But that is the first time I realized what the government can do. Unfortunately, our first impression of the government is corruption. But there are so many people who are uncorrupt, working for the public funds as well. And they're doing it in the right way. So that's bureaucracy on the other side where execution is like done. So three days of international conference and, you know, we had the best of best. And, you know, thanks to, uh, of course, I got some award from the governor and all those things. Second important thing, because it was delivered very well. Okay, because let me tell you something, my dear friends. Government also want good people to work with them. Mm. Who doesn't want good people, right? So I forgot and I said, okay, move on. But immediately after I got a call again from the same minister in the parliament and saying that now let's do it international. I said, what do you mean by international? Okay, India ho gaya, ab New York mein karte. And you'd be surprised. Again, I was given the power. Remember this, power is for service. Power should not be used for your benefit. So, so International Yoga Day, we did in New York a uh, year after that. And it was such a successful conference that I took around 60 people from India. Again, government budgets, public funds. Believe me, it was one of the most successful academic conference happening right there in New York. We are hosted by the Council General. You know, I can still feel the power right now. Because when we landed up in New York, okay, think about this, friends. The actual people, the government representatives, the diplomats in U.S. representing our country, came and received us inside the plane. Mm. Now, what does it mean? Don't think that it's about me. We are representing a government. And half of our academicians who went over there had what we call it as official passport. What is an official passport? Most of the Indians will have what we call it as a, a blue passport. But the blue passport is like a normal citizen, but there are different levels of passport also. So many of us actually carried what is called a white, white passport. So you are representing the government of India. Okay. And of course, you have to be very careful about it because uh, you should never misuse the power. At the same time, you are also representing a culture, a civilization, a country. We did it, we came back, and of course the passport is taken away, okay? That's temporary. Wow. So what generally happens is that we are representing a country, whether it's a diplomat, or an ambassador, or uh, even if you are on a certain government assignments, the government gives you the power to handle those responsibilities. And once, remember this, once the responsibilities are over, you need to surrender your power also. Mm. So one thing I learned being in the government is that, you know, you will get the certain power, but remember, you're in a mission mode. The day the mission is over, you should be a common man again. Mm. The third part is, of course, the armed forces, the military part of it. It's a huge machinery. I'm still learning. But I do teach Kautilya Artha Shastra uh, to the, the leadership team in the armed forces. I'm still a student, but I'm teaching them. What does that entail? So, Artha Shastra of Kautilya, okay, which my area of specialization is Chanakya's wisdom, talks about a lot of military strategies. And it's the geopolitical ideas like Mandala theory, Samadana Dandabheda. So, unfortunately, we Indians have to awaken to our own knowledge. So, I'm being a small role in playing that. 
awakening the armed forces and think listen this is our knowledge you know why don't you apply it so that's happened yeah, i've heard that chanakya's teachings are so kind of renowned all over the world that other countries also use it in their military training yes uh, and but the indian military also does yes, yes. has has it always used it uh, so i would say that india always used it but pre post british era right? you know it's more about what's happening in the western world i'm not saying that we should not to be aware of what's happening abroad i mean we need to get the best of the weapons the missiles everything is fine yet you know that's a very famous statement the man behind the machine is more important than the machine hmm. so at the strategy level at the thinking level are you having an indian strategies so fortunately we have a lot of wisdom in our own ancient indian script about how to handle war and conflicts hmm. so you know i'm teaching that hmm.